بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله initially السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so the Saudi Society of Nephrology and uh, Transplantation uh, very happy to welcome uh, our uh, speaker and the chairpersons and welcome all of you uh, we are as you know we are continuing giving uh, our uh, webinars uh, uh, almost uh, once monthly if not uh, twice uh, monthly uh, so uh, initially I would like to thank uh, the uh, sponsor company for uh, for uh, today uh, uh, webinars and uh, without their uh, support uh, we cannot as you know continue uh, giving all of these talk so without taking uh, much of times uh, uh, the mics I will give the mics to our moderators uh, Dr. Uh, Weamel Miman is the consultant pediatric nephrology at the uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and uh, research uh, centers. Uh, please, if you have uh, any uh, questions, uh, use the icons of Q and A, write your uh, questions and uh, we'll answer to it at the end of the talk. Uh, the mic is your uh, Dr. Oyam. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khaled. Um, <clears throat> today, the uh, Saudi Society of Pediatric Nephrology is uh, pleased to have a very, very special guest speaker uh, who will present to us over the next hour a very special rare inherited disorder, which is X-linked hypophosphatemia. It's a disease, as you know, with shared care between uh, pediatricians, nephrologists, and endocrinologists. In some countries, patients with this disease are followed by endocrinologists alone. In other countries, followed by nephrologists. So I would like to welcome all the audience from all the different sub uh, subspecialties who are joining us today. Over the next hour, we will enjoy this talk presented by our spe special guest, uh, Dr. Uh, Francisco Emma. Uh, Dr. Emma is a well-known and recognized figure in pediatric astrology. He is a main editor um, uh, for our textbook, the Pediatric Nephrology Textbook. Uh, Dr. Emma received his medical degree from the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium, where he specialized in pediatrics. He subsequently uh, completed his training in pediatric nephrology at Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. He moved to the Bambino Gesso Children's Hospital in Rome in 1998 and was appointed head of the pediatric nephrology um, uh, division in 2005. He currently holds the position of uh, head of the Department of Pediatric Subspecialities. Dr. Emma's primary research interests uh, lie in uh, rare uh, renal diseases, in particular cystinosis and nephrotic syndrome and many other conditions. Uh, please enjoy the talk. And the first part of the talk will be kind of pathophysiology of the FTF23. And then the next part will be about the disease, the X-linked hypophosphatemia. Dr. Emma, the microphone is all yours. Well, thank you very much, Dr. William, and, uh, and, and I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me, and in particular, um, Khalid um, Alassan for asking me to give you this talk. So, as uh, Dr. William uh, just told you, what I would do is that I would first review the physiology of uh, phosphate homostasis and, F, um, and of um, FGF23, um, and then um, I will talk to you about uh, um, uh, X-linked hypophosphatemia. Um, I'm speaking like this because I have a banner that I prevent me to see well the screen. Okay, so let me just remind you the physiology of phosphate homeostasis. So as you know, we absorb phosphate in the diet. It's reabsorbed. It's approximately one gram per day. And it's sort of in equilibrium between uh, the blood and the bones and the intracellular compartment. And so what is reabsorbed is eventually filtered in the urine. And um, the um, important aspect is that um, in the blood, there is less than 1% of the total body phosphorus and most of it is um, in the bones. Now, there are a number of hormones that control the phosphate homeostasis, 
And the main ones are um, illustrated here, and it's PTH and FGF23 that control phosphate reabsorption in the tubules. In the bones, it's mostly PTH and 125-hydroxyvitamin D, and 125-hydroxyvitamin D is very important also for phosphate reabsorption. And of course, there are other factors and hormones that regulate phosphate, but these are the ones that are, we are really interested in the diseases that we um, will review today. So at the renal level, what happens is that most of the phosphate is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. And it is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule through two sodium copper transporters that we, we, we usually call NAPI2A and NAPI2C. So sodium phosphate co-transporter A and C. And, and, and these transporters are expressed in the apical surface of proximal tubular cells so that phosphate is reabsorbed coupled to sodium. The stoichiometry is a little bit different between the two transporters, also the regulation, but um, I would, um, that doesn't really concern us for this talk. What is important is what is depicted here, and these are seminal works that have been done in the late 90s, and that really have shown something really important. And that is the way that sodium phosphate co-transporter are regulated. So there are different ways that a cell can transport phosphate. It can increase the number of transporters or it in, can increase the activity of transporters. And what was really shown by these seminal studies is that what changes is not the affinity of the transporter for phosphate, but it's the Vmax which is increased. And that means that the regulation of phosphate transporter is operated through insertion and retrieval of phosphate co-transporter by from the apical membrane. So if you add PTH or if you add FGF23, you decrease the number of transporters and by expressing less transporter, then you lose phosphate in the urine. So FGF23 regulates phosphate transporter by decreasing the number of transporters and by decreasing proximal tubular reabsorption of phosphate. In addition to that, FGF23 also decreases the activation of vitamin D in the proximal tubule. And it does this by two means. One, it decreases the activity of the 1-alpha hydroxylase. And B, it increases the conversion of 125-vitamin D into calcitriolic acid, which is not active. So it decreased the activation and it increased the inactivation. And this system is, of course, very complex. There are a number of feedback loops um, that um, um, when, uh, right now um, um, uh, is, uh, are not concerned with this talk. So to sort of recapitulate, what happens is that when phosphate is increased, what we do is that we produce in osteocyte FGF23. FGF23 decreases phosphate reabsorption in the proximal tubule. It also, high phosphate also has a direct effect on phosphate reabsorption and also an indirect effect through PTH. The other thing that FGF23 does is that it decreases 125 vitamin D which decreases phosphate reabsorption and together this decreases the phosphate. So FGF23 is really the major regulator of phosphate in our, um, in our system. So to understand X-linked hypophosphatemia, what I always find is that it's very instructive to review the history of hypophosphatemia, because by reviewing the history, we also understand the mechanism of hypophosphatemia and also other diseases. So the first description of um, vitamin D resistant briquettes was made by Albright in 1937, who described for the first time five infants 
that had a rickets that was resistant to vitamin D. And then it took many years before we really understood that the disease was inherited in an X-linked mode. And as I will show you in a moment, because women also, um, care women also um, express the disease, this was really not easy um, to, um, to, 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 to elucidate. And then another seminal description and understanding was made in the 70s, where it was shown that a few patients that had gone to end-stage kidney disease and received a kidney transplant, at that time, these were the first kidney transplants, actually had a relapse of hypophosphatemia in the transplanted kidney. And this observation was really important because it was the demonstration that the disease was not in the kidney, but the disease was in something that was circulating that induced the kidney to lose phosphate. And then by positional cloning in 1995, the FEX gene was described first in children and later also in adults that had adult onset vitamin D resistant foster malicia. And the another, another important discovery was in 2000, the fact that FGF23 was in fact causing mutation in autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic rickets. So at that time, the link between FAX mutation and FGF23 was still not clear, but soon after it was described that there were some patients that had tumor associated hypophosphatemia. And these patients were actually producing in their tumor FGF23 and then FGF23 became the first candidate as a phosphaturic hormone, and it was thereafter demonstrated that patients with XLH have high FGF23. And in fact, there were some hints about this because FGF23 could potentially be a substrate of the FEX gene. And on this basis, in 2009, it was published that antibodies against anti-FGF23 actually reversed the phenotype in an ortholog model of XLH in the mouse, the hip mouse. And, um, and then in 2014, the first clinical trial with pirosumab was made. So you see that just by looking at the history of hypophosphatemia, we sort of understand the physiology. Let me just show you this a little bit more in detail. These were the description of the mutation in the FEX gene, which initially was called PEX gene, um, in X-linked hypophosphatemia in children and then in adults with osteomalacia. And one thing that I would like to point out to you here is that the female carriers that still express some proteins actually have rickets. So there is a, 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 a full penetrance of the disease in females. So when you look at these pedigrees, you can see male to female and female to male trans admission, but in actually the disease is really X-linked and is, um, is uh, transmitted by female. In autosomal dominant, um, XLH, uh, hypophosphatemic rickets. So, sorry, and you can see that these pedigrees actually are not that different from the other ones. You have mutation in FGF23. And really, this was really not very well understood until it was really shown that the mutation actually um, caused a defect um, in uh, the cleavage of FGF23. But prior to this, this description was made in patients that had tumor-induced osteomalacia, and these patients had high FGF23. And if you express FGF23 in mice, um, and you transplant these mice with cells that are overexpressing FGF23, you induce hypophosphatemia and you induce rickets. And this is what I was just telling you. This was actually um, published the next year. These patients with autosomal dominant of FGF23, uh, hypophosphatemic rickets, in reality, have all the same mutations. And with these mutations, they have lower phosphates, 
and uh, the mice that uh, actually reproduce this uh, phenotype have rickets. And what happens really is that those mutations are in a specific region of FGF23, and this region is the region which is cleaved. And this cleavage inactivates FGF23. So these patients that have autosomal dominant apophosphatemic rickets in reality have mutation that prevent cleavage and thereby they have FGF23 levels that uh, FGF23 uh, proteins that are more active because they cannot be inactivated. And so it's on this basis that in 2002, the first report came out showing high FGF23 in patients with XLH. This is a patient, patients with tumor induced osteomalacia. You can see that once you remove the tumor, the phosphate increase and FGF23 decreases. So this was really a proof that FGF23 was the phosphaturic hormones. And soon after, um, a, a large consortium published exactly the same thing uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. You notice that FGF23 are increased in patients with XLH and also in patients with oncogenic osteomalacia. One thing that I will point out to you here is that there are still some patients that have normal or normal high FGF23, especially um, um, uh, if they are young adults. So um, you should always keep this in mind. And then FGF23 really appeared to be the phosphaturic hormone uh, by excellence when it was also shown that there is another disease that um, is epidermal nervous syndrome. And these are patients with this epidermal nerve uh, nevi, nevi that also have osteomalacia or rickets. And this is another example. And it was shown that in fact, these patients have mutation in these two proto-orcogenes, which are GTPases. And in fact, these increase the production of FGF23. And then finally, it was also shown that some patients with um, fibrous dysplasia um, develop hypophosphatemia. And it turns out that these patients also have IFGF23. So to sort of summarize this part of the talk, what we know is that FGF23 increases if you have high phosphate, also, in fact, if you have high 125 vitamin D and if you have um, elevated cloto and you have mutation in genes that activate FGF23 from osteocytes um, and the, the, the most frequent one is the FEX gene, but there are other genes that have similar function. There's some very rare mutations where actually there is a gain of function in FGF receptor one, um, and that gain of function increases signal transduction and also causes increased um, FGF23. Then you have patients that have a tumor that in, in fact causes the creation of a fusion protein that does much of the same as these mutations here. It causes increased signaling by FGF receptor one, and that increases FGF23. In epidermal nervous syndrome, these two proto-oncogene increase the production of FGF23. And finally, there are some patients with McCunnell-Bright syndrome that have hypophosphatemia because they have an increased protein kinase A signaling and increased FGF23. So all these diseases have high FGF23, but all of all these, XLH um, is responsible for more than 80% of the cases. They have lower T, uh, phosphate, they have lower TMP of the GFR, so they have a lower threshold for phosphate reabsorption in the kidneys. And they also tend to have lower level of 125 hydroxy vitamin D, because as I just shown you, they inactivate the hydroxylation in position one, and they um, and it stimulates the inactivation of 125 vitamin D. Now you can also have hypophosphatemia because your kidney doesn't work well. For example, if you have Fanconi syndrome, 
And these are examples of some of my patients with cystinosis, with idiopathic Fanconi syndrome, with tyrosinemia, or with dent disease that have developed um, rickets. Uh, now, these patients have low molecular weight proteinuria, all of them, and they tend to have also renal tubular acidosis, aminoaciduria, glycosuria, so you can recognize them by looking at these other factors that are leaked in the urines. But then you can also have hypophosphatemia because NAPI2A or NAPI2C are mutated. And in these cases also, you have hypophosphatemia with a lower TMP for GFR, and you tend to have lower vitamin D. Now, these patients should be recognized because if you treat them with vitamin D, you actually do harm to your patients, and I'll show you this in a moment. So this is what happens. So I've shown you that this is uh, NAPI2A, and this is the normal stimulation with FGF23. So FGF23 inhibits the activity of NAPI2A by retrieving the protein from the membrane and inactivates 125-hydroxyvitamin uh, D. Now, if you have a mutation of NAPI2A, what happens is that your phosphate in your blood tends to decrease. If you have lower phosphate, you have lower FGF23. If you have lower FGF23, you have more 125 vitamin D, and that causes hypercalcemia and hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis. So if you give to these patients vitamin D, you will increase nephrocalcinosis. Mutations in NAPI2A usually cause nephrocalcinosis, but usually don't cause uh, a bone disease. And um, the metabolic uh, abnormalities tend to improve with age. But mutation with of um, NAPI2C, so this is the gene SNC34A3, usually cause rickets. Nearly all patients develop nephrolithiasis or nephrocalcinosis. Um, and, and you have bone diseases in about 20% of patients. So you should recognize these patients. These are autosomal recessive disorders, not to treat them with uh, vitamin D. Now, the rest of the talk will be concentrated on XLH. Now, XLH, as I showed you, are due to mutations in the FEX gene. And when you have a mutation in the FEX gene, for reasons that we still don't completely understand, osteocytes produce more FGF23. So you decrease your phosphate transporters, you decrease vitamin D activations. I think this is now clear. That will decrease the level of 125 vitamin D. It will increase phosphaturia. Your serum phosphate will decrease, and this will cause rickets. Now, from a metabolic standpoint, you see that the patients have higher alkaline phosphatase. They have a lower threshold for tubular reabsorption of phosphate in their kidneys. If you measure their vitamin D levels, they're normal and their PTH is normal. And they usually have a family history, but you should know that there are um, a certain percentage, 10 to 20% of patients that actually can have de novo mutations. And also that in some families, the disease has not been recognized simply because the, 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 the mother, for example, had a short stature, but was not recognized really as having rickets. Now in this scheme, uh, there are some things that are missing. One is that um, there could be a direct effect of FGF23 on bones, and we will come back to this. And also what we don't know is whether the mutation of the FEX gene itself could not participate in the bone phenotype of these patients. So these are the patients with XLH. Um, and uh, there are some specific symptoms that you recognize in children. Um, they can have a delay in disproportional growth, um, a craniosynostosis, they have rickets, obviously. And um, they can have delayed motor development, and they usually have uh, gait abnormalities. So they walk with their um, legs that are um, uh, apart, and they tend to walk uh, um, later, to start walking later. 
Some symptoms are common to children and adults, obviously short stature, the deformity of the legs. Patients have tooth abscesses and excessive dental caries. Uh, caries. Um, I will show you this in a more detail in a moment. Um, they have osteomalacia. They can complain of bone and joint pain. They have joint stiffness, uh, muscle pain, and weakness. Um, they can have carry malformation. Um, they have gait abnormalities because of their bone deformation, but also because they have muscle weakness. Um, and overall, the quality of life is diminished. And then adults have other symptoms, which are sort of degenerative symptoms due to the bone lesions that have developed during childhood. So they have weakened bone, they can have fracture, osteoarthritis, I'll show you this in a moment, and extra osseo calcification, which can be very painful. And in time, they can develop hearing losses and they um, have um, disability that impact their daily life. So um, this is the typical lesion. You can see the leg bowing. Um, I think you all recognize the metaphysio playing and also this very irregular calcification of the growth plate. What is important is that on this X-ray, you don't see evidence of bone reabsorption which would be caused by PTH, for example, in nutritional rickets. And here you don't, PTH is normal in this disease, at least in the beginning. And that diagnosis, phosphate is low, calcium is usually normal or is in the lower normal range. And PTH is normal because these patients don't have, unlike vitamin deficiency, um, they have a normal calcium. And FGF23 is high. Now, I would insist, and I've underlined here, it's before therapy, because when you give therapy, these values can change. And there are some patients that have borderline high FGF23 in the beginning. And, and, and this, is, um, and this um, is especially true in young adults that have not been diagnosed before. If you do a bone biopsy in these patients, here is what you see. On your left, you have a normal bone. So everything which is red is osteoid, is uncalcified bone. And in green, you see mineralized bone. And what you have in your right hand side is a typical biopsy of a patient with XLH. And you immediately recognize that these patients have a defect in bone mineralization. You see much more red in that uh, picture. And, um, and the osteoid metric is increased. And that causes the leg bowing, the lesions that I just shown you. Patients can also have coxavara, which all which with further uh, um, uh, um, makes their gait abnormal. And they can also have genovirus, and genovirus is extremely debilitating in these patients because they cross their knees in the midline and they cannot walk. So they have really have to walk by, by going circling their, 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 their legs around um, the other. So um, some of these patients can really have um, um, very disabilitating um, features in their lower limbs. So their legs are shorter, but their trunk tends to be normal. These are two twins. So they have a gross retardation, but this gross retardation is disproportional. Um, and their sitting height is usually, uh, is usually uh, normal or close to normal, uh, while the standing height is decreased. Now, other feature of the disease is the craniosynostosis. Um, that it uh, should always be checked. And if you have a craniosynostosis, it's important to perform surgery on time. Um, as I told you, about 15% of patients can have a, a, a carry malformation, which usually is not symptomatic. So unless you do an MRI, in some center people do that systematically on CT scan, you will not recognize it. And with time, Patients can sometimes develop hearing losses that are probably due to compressions and also sometimes spinal stenosis. So you should always check neurologically at the lower limbs, your, your patients, they, they can have symptoms. When they are adults and they develop osteomalacia, they can have 
pseudo fractures of fracture you can see here examples of pseudo fracture or fractures of these patients and if they've not been treated during childhood appropriately their bones are deformed and so with time they develop uh, degenerative osteoarthropathies and these can be very painful you see them here at levels um, of the hips they're very frequent at the level of the ankles, of the knees, at the sacroiliac uh, joint, um, but you also see here at the level of the spine. So patients can also have vertebral uh, compressions that can be very painful. And the other thing that really decreases the quality of life with these patients is the antisopathy. And antisopathy is the calcification of tendons and ligaments. You see here an um, Achille tendon which is calcified um, uh, and here calcification at the level of the rotula, which are extremely painful. And usually they are reported in the ankles, in the knees, in the pelvis, in the spine. So um, these are very painful symptoms. And um, the most important thing is that these symptoms actually really don't respond to conventional treatment. Now, the other organ which is compromised in XLH are the teeth. Um, and, um, and FGF23 acts on the bone, but it also acts on the teeth. And so what these patients have is a dentin which is poorly mineralized. So it's a fragile dentin um, which um, can be easily infected. And so these patients tend to have caries. Um, they um, have an animal hypoplasia. Um, they have enlarged uh, pulp chambers, um, and they can develop uh, abscesses. And these actually are reported in as much as 30 to 40% of patients. And in some of these patients, this can be extremely debilitating. In addition to that, the mandibula are, are smaller, so they tend to have uh, mouth position and dental mouth position. So how do you treat XLH? So I told you, I hope um, uh, extensively, that patients have low phosphate and they have low 125 vitamin D. So the, the natural way of treating these patients was initially to give them phosphate supplementation and active vitamin D supplements, or at least one alpha equivalent. Um, you can give alpha calcidiol, for example. Um, now, the goal of this treatment, which is still a treatment that um, is used if you don't have access to anti-FGF23 antibodies, is to try to heal the rickets. Uh, but it's not always possible, so you should aim at least to decrease alkaline phosphatase to less than 1.5 uh, times the upper limit of the normal and to improve the clinical and the biological signs. So the goal is also to improve growth and to try to have a growth um, at, the, uh, at the lower limit of the normal range, but to try to reach the normal range and also to control pain. And for patients, this is extremely important. The goal is not to normalize phosphate. If you try to normalize phosphate, you will need to give huge amounts of phosphate and by giving this, the phosphate that is filtering the kidney will take with it also calcium. You will, you will enhance the risk of nephrocalcinosis, but mostly you will um, induce hyperparathyroidism. One thing that has been reported in all studies is that early treatment is clearly associated with better outcome. And the outcome can really be improved by uh, conventional treatment. Um, this is a, a very old paper, it's from 1985, and you can see a patient that responded very well. You can see here a lot of osteoid matrix um, in red, and you can see half the treatment in the bone biopsy. And when you label with tetracycline, you can see that there is increased bone formation. Unfortunately, um, these patients are not common. And in most patients, this treatment improves symptoms but cannot completely cure the disease. And by and large, many of these patients remain symptomatic. The linear growth is still insufficient in most cases, 
And when they become adults, many patients can still have hearing losses, but um, in many of these patients, actually it's not a severe hearing loss. And as I mentioned to you, the enthesopathy is not prevented. In addition, these treatments have side effects. And the two major side effects is that if you give too much vitamin D, you can induce nephrocalcinosis. Um, and um, if you give too much phosphate, you can induce hyperparathyroidism. And so when you treat this patient, it's always a balance between giving enough treatment and preventing side effects. So for example, in my patients, I have very few patients with nephrocalcinosis, but when I compare the growth of my patients, actually it's a little bit less good than what is reported in other centers that have more nephrocalcinosis. So it's always a trade-off when you use conventional symptoms. The other thing is that when you use calcitriol and phosphate, in fact, you tend to increase, not in every patient, but you tend to increase FGF23, which is exactly what you don't want to have um, in these patients. Now, this is um, the same cartoon that I've already shown. And um, I'm showing you this because um, the other alternative here is instead of giving vitamin D and phosphate, is to block FGF23. And this is the base on the normal, on the modern treatment that we um, are using in these patients. So um, Burosumab, this is the name of the monoclonal antibodies, was actually developed after experimental data in the hip mouse. As I told you, the hip mouse is an orthologue model um, of X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets in mice. And so because FGF23 levels were increased in these um, animals, um, then um, uh, it has been shown uh, antibody against anti-FGF23 were developed and were tested in mouse. And as you can see, if you treat these animals with antibody anti-FGF23, the level of phosphate increase, 125 vitamin D increase, NAPI2A, is again expressed in the proximal tubule. This is the untreated mice and rickets improved. And so on this basis, the monoclonal antibody for human use was developed. Burosomide was tested in, in a first uh, uh, um, uh, a pilot study. And then in this, uh, in, in this study that was published by uh, Dr. Carpenter and his colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018. And you see that by treating these patients every 15 um, days with burosumab, the level of phosphate normalized quite rapidly within two or three months. 125 vitamin D, hydroxy vitamin D increases. The renal tubular phosphate reabsorption threshold um, increases and nearly normalized and progressively over six to nine months, alkaline phosphatase decrease and eventually normalize. So it's a wonderful uh, metabolic response. Now, what happens in terms of radiological response? Well, the radiological response in these patients were actually also very good. You can see here lesion as the one that I've shown you. And after two months, you see that the, the, the metaphysial lucency, so this lack of calcification of, of uh, uh, the cross plates uh, was nearly normalized. In this case, you see here the fraying of the, met, uh, the metaphysis. And you see here after 40 weeks of this small child that was treated, um, the improved calcification, look here at the tibia and compare this tibia with this tibia. You have the same thing at the ulnar level, um, you have this nearly complete normalization here after one year of treatment. You can uh, use scores. Um, the one that was used is what is called the Ricketts severity score. And you can see scores there um, improve. Um, there are also other scores, but they basically all show the same thing. And in addition to this, patients have functional improvement and pain is also very rapidly controlled with this antibody 
we didn't observe so much as an effect on growth. These are patients that were treated actually very young. Um, the dark dots are um, related to heights um, in patients that treated buvazumab and the epitin dots were patients before buvazumab. What you can see is that they stop losing height, uh, but at least um, in this short follow-up, there was not a major catch-up. Um, these are other patients that we've been treated. You see much of the same. Um, as a matter of fact, the most recent data show that probably there is a small gain of 0.1 standard deviation per year, which, which is not a lot. But if you can treat patients very early, for example, and you treat them for 10 years, potentially you can also gain one standard deviation. So I think that's simply um, for, for, for appreciating the effect on growth, we, we don't have enough follow-up, but this is something that we will need to follow in the next years. So um, these were treatments in children, and obviously children were the obvious target to initiate treatment because they have rickets. So um, these were the patients that potentially could have the major benefit, but then the, the burosumab was also tested in randomized trials, also in adults. I'm not showing you all the data. Suffices to say that just as in children, um, uh, burosumab normalizes serum phosphate and TMP of a GFR and the other parameters that I've shown you in children. And in adults, it has a clear effect in improving stiffness, um, in improving physical impairment, and also in accelerating fracture healing, which um, in patient, adult patients that tend to have a number of fractures um, um, is important. And uh, a few of these patients accepted to undergo a bone biopsy. And you can see this was uh, before treatment and after one year of treatment, you see in these patients an improvement in the volume of the osteoidic matrix, um, which is much decreased. So the bone has become mineralized and the osteoid surface um, has decreased. Now, um, this brings me to the end of this presentation. Uh, for those of you who are interested, we have developed together with a, a, a number of colleagues which um, have interest in this disease, um, clinical practice recommendations that have been published uh, um, two years ago. Um, so I would, um, I would um, uh, advocate that I would suggest that you um, go and, 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 and review this uh, uh, recommendation. You will see in this recommendation also advice on when to check your patient, on how to make the diagnosis, on when to do x-ray, on surgical management, on the management of dental uh, symptoms. At that time, we only had the first data on burosumab. So in terms of burosumab treatment, we will need to update this recommendation, which is planned, I think, for next year. Um, and these slides sort of summarize. So if you follow me, if you have a patient with low serum phosphate, measure levels of PTH. If it's high, you should check calcium. Uh, you probably have hypocalcemia, vitamin D deficiency or calcium deficiency or a primary hyperparathyroidism. If calcium is normal or low, then measure your urine phosphate. Um, if it's low, which is sort of rare, you're losing phosphate in your GI, you have insufficient um, reabsorption or uptake. If phosphate in the urine is high, then FGF23, which is difficult to measure, not everybody can measure this, uh, is probably the key. If it's high, the most likely diagnosis is HLH. If it's normal or if it's no, then the problem is not in FGF23, the problem is in the kidney. So you're losing phosphate because your kidney has a disease, you have Fanconi syndrome, or you have hereditary hyperphosphatemic records with hypercalcemia, which is due to mutation in NAPI2C. And with this, I thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Emma. It was really a very uh, elegant uh, talk.
And now uh, it's the time to uh, take some questions <clears throat> from the audience. Um, I received a question from a pediatric endocrinologist, uh, Dr. Ahud Zahrani. Um, uh, the question is, in case of a newly diagnosed patient with X-linked uh, hypophosphatemia, would you recommend to start the conventional therapy phosphate and active form of vitamin D as a first step uh, or to start immediately with Bursinab in, in the newly uh, diagnosed patient? So, um, so this really depends on the country um, where, you, where you work and on the rules for prescribing Bursinab. I think Bursinab is a more etiological uh, treatment and it also tends to work better. So um, I think the, the final uh, word on the indication of pyrosomine still has to be written. But as far as I'm concerned, if I have a patient which has overt XLH, if I have access to pyrosomine, I prefer to start pyrosomine. Um, what we don't have is data on the treatment of very, very small children in infants. There is a, a trial uh, which is ongoing and we are waiting uh, for the result of this trial. Actually, some of our, my patients are involved in this trial. So um, well, we don't know whether it's, it's, it's safe to be start this treatment in the first months of life. Um, and, and, but this data will be available, I think, very soon. So the answer, the short answer, unless it's one of these patients with very few symptoms, um, in general, I think the best choice is to start giving us an plus. Okay, clear. Thank you, doctor. Uh, the next question is, um, is dental abscess expected to improve with Burosumab? And if not, why the dental abscess is not improving with it? We don't know. We need more follow-up. We need more follow-up. We still don't have very clear data on that. Okay, so I, I cannot answer. We need long-term data to have a final take. For example, for the enthesopathy, we, we know that it doesn't respond. So what I would say is that if you treat very early with conventional therapy, um, overall the symptoms improve, including also uh, dental uh, symptoms. So I would, so it's, it's not unlikely that if you treat with pyrosomab, you, you will have a positive impact uh, on the teeth. At least I'm not aware of data that show this very clearly. In terms of the enthesopathy, we really don't have any data because these are adult patients that have developed the enthesopathy in over the years. So we don't have patients that have been treated since childhood into adulthood to be able to say whether this will be able to prevent the enthesopathy. It's clearly something that we hope for. Right, okay. Uh, we have another question from uh, Ijaik. Um, so the question is, what is the youngest age in which, in which this drug can be used? I think the Birzumab. One year, one year, but we are waiting for data of younger patients. So the trial is ongoing. All right. And uh, another uh, two questions from a pediatric nephrologist, Dr. Naifa Porashi. In case of a de novo mutation, uh, would the passage of the disease to their kids be different than the other regular mutations? No. It's the same. It's absolutely the same, yeah. Okay. The next question from Dr. Naif as well. Uh, we as pediatric nephrologists notice different response among patients to uh, phosphate and calcitriol therapy uh, on, in terms of growth of bones and height, even with correction of the phosphate level. So is there a rule for growth hormone? And if yes, when is the right time to start it? Yeah, this is just a very good question. So, so the, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't um, uh, remember the name of the, the, the person who asked the question, but um, yes. So one thing that I haven't mentioned that I should have mentioned is that there is phenotypic variability. So we that treat these patients, we know very well that there are some patients that terrible, tremendous disease, and other patients have a milder disease, and especially a disease that has, can respond to conventional therapy better. 
So I have a few patients, it's, it's not the majority of patients, but I have a few patients that actually with the conventional therapy have responded, um, have responded well. So um, this, um, um, this heterogeneity in the response um, is clearly described and can also be observed within the family. Now, you have to forgive me, but I've forgotten the second half of the question. Um, so the second half of the question is uh, like, when is the right time to start the growth hormone? Okay, and, and, and so, so, so growth hormone has been tested in these patients. And so if you give growth hormone to these patients, you will see an improvement. Now, one thing you should be careful of is that if you treat patients with phosphate and too much phosphate, you can induce hyperphosphatemia, uh, uh, hyperparathyroidism. And when, when you have hyperparathyroidism, you always should be careful in prescribing growth hormone. But in patients that have normal PTH level, you can try to give um, growth hormone and they tend to have a good response. What is unclear is whether you will change the final height. And um, some data has been recently published and they've been a little bit disappointing in terms of final height. So you can have an increase in height, but the final height is not necessarily improved. And so when we uh, wrote the recommendations, we um, we've not been very um, prescribe, uh, prescriptive in terms of growth hormone because of this. Now, the other concern that there was in growth hormone was that because they have a disproportional um, height, um, was that by giving growth hormone, you would uh, worsen the disproportional um, aspect of this patient, but this has not been observed. All right. The question that remains, you know, I've shown you the data on furosemab and growth, and I told you that we we'll still need to wait to know the impact that bulosumab has on height is whether there is an indication to add growth hormone to patients on bulosumab. And this is something which people are starting to investigate. And I think that in the next years, um, this will be an important aspect of the treatment. All right, and there is a question um from my may uh, Mossad, forgive me if it's if I pronounce it wrongly. Uh, why we will give them oral phosphate if our goal is not to normalize it? So your goal, so you need phosphate because if you make bone, you need to to have phosphate. You're losing phosphate. The point is that you need to increase your phosphate balance, but you don't necessarily need a phosphate of three milligrams per deciliter or four milligrams per deciliter to make good bones. Um, so your goal is to give enough phosphate to try to bring down your alkaline phosphatase. So what you're trying to do is to treat the rickets, not to treat a number. So what you want is to improve rickets, not to um, uh, have um, a normal phosphate. Um, um, and again, it's because of what I said, if you give too much phosphate, you will do harm. You will cause hyperparathyroidism. And if you think about it, in a patient that has rickets or osteomalacia, the last thing you want is high PTH because you will, you will do harm to your bones. So if you give too much phosphate, you will increase so, um, the PTH. So, this is what you need to do. You just need to give enough phosphate, but not too much. All right. Thank you, doctor. Um, uh, there is a question, uh, not very clear to me, but uh, apparently asking about the quality of life. So this will lead me to ask you, um, like if we use this uh, birsamide uh, in, in, in adult patients, Will this improve the, the function of their um, joints? Uh, the, the data from the randomized trial really showed us that um, stiffness is really improved. And, um, and, 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 and we have evidence that the quality of life uh, of these patients is improved with Birojima. There is, um, you know, 
few years ago, we were just, there were these data were initial, but now I think the evidence is there to say that it's the case. And so the quality of life of these patients clearly improved. And one of the things that improves um, um, most rapidly is pain control. So uh, all the patients that um, I've seen treated or that I've treated myself, uh, what they tell you, the first thing they tell you, um, at least the adult patients, is that their bone pain and joint pain is much better, is much improved. So there is a real effect on pain control. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, I think um, I would just check if there is any more. Uh, okay. What, what are the, from, from Noura, uh, what are side effects of uh, Birsumab from your experience? Do you give also phosphates and vitamin D together with Birsumab? No, so when you give Birosumab, because you are you, you, you have to stop vitamin D and phosphate, because um, you, 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 you're blocking FGF23, um, so there is no sense in giving phosphate and vitamin D, because your vitamin D is then hydroxylated, but, but to add to this, you, you carry the risk of inducing hyperphosphatemia, which you, you don't want either. So um, you need to stop conventional treatment. Um, and, and the first part of the question was, sorry? Um, what are the side effects of Birsumab? Okay, the, the side effect, look, the most reported side effect is in some patients that have some um, uh, limited inflammatory uh, reaction at the site of the injection. Uh, but the very few other side effects. It's a relatively well, it's a very well tolerated drug. Okay. I mean, this is the case. I'm not, I don't want to sound like I'm making a publicity for the drug, but honestly, it's, it's very well tolerated. Yeah. I think the side effect, the highest side effect is the price. Uh, sorry? Is the price. That's the real side effect of the drug, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's, it's more expensive than conventional treatment. There is no question about it. Right. Uh, now, there is um, a question uh, about, can we use it in MDD of CKD? Yeah, so in case if they already developed defocalcinosis and chronic kidney disease, and they have uh, one mineral disorder, can we use uh, the Birsumab? I think there is, so, so if you have bone disease, actually, this is one more reason to use it. In terms of renal uh, failure, I, 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 don't, I don't recall data on renal failure. Now, you know, in renal failure, you have to be careful because there's a moment where you start accumulating phosphate and pyrosomab can increase your phosphate level. So um, I, I don't, I, I don't, I mean, I don't have the data to answer this question. Um, I would say that you probably don't want to use furosemab um, in, um, in advanced um, chronic renal failure. Um, and you would only use it in patients that still have a low phosphate. So this would be patients which um, have uh, mild renal failure, but not advanced renal failure. But I don't think we have the data. Um, to, to answer this question. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, I think uh, that's all for the questions and uh, we will finish on time. We can okay. conclude now. Uh, I, I would like to really thank you, uh, Dr. Francisco Emma for this great, uh, very, very interesting talk and uh, see you all in the next webinars. Uh, thank you. Okay, so I would like uh, actually uh, to thank you, uh, we, uh, we am for excellent uh, chairing of the sessions, and I would like to thank Professor Francisco Ima. Uh, he was accepting uh, our invitation and give a uh, really uh, very terrific uh, talk about this uh, uh, not uh, common disease. Uh, actually, you mentioned uh, for the uh, uh, in the, your paper in the Nature Review that uh, you need, sometimes you need to do the serum level of FGF23. I don't know how, how widely available uh, this test and is it also the, the price of it? 
you know, it's, it's you know, I honestly think that um, if if you have access to genetic testing, it's the best way to go, honestly. So if you don't have access to uh, genetic testing, we said, look, you can measure FGF23. But the important thing is that you need to measure FGF23 before any treatment, because the treatment will modify your level of FGF23. And the other things that um, is, is difficult was to, to put a threshold and we sort of put a threshold around 30. So because some patients don't have very high FGF23. Um, so in some patients, it gives you a very clear answer and in another, um, you can have some borderline levels. Um, and then to finally answer your question, um, FGF23 is not a difficult uh, test, um, but it's an ELISA. It's simply expensive. Um, so there are not many places where you can make the dosage, but if you have access to the commercial kit to measure FGF23, it's an ELISA. I see that your mic is turned off, Khalid. So, Dr. William, okay. Just, just one second. Now you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. So, thank, thank you very much, uh, Francisco. I would like to disclose that we have over three thousand uh, uh, attendees in <laughs> our Zoom, and about a couple of hundreds in YouTube, which is a really a tremendous number of attendees. Um, the other thing I would like actually uh, to uh, really thanks um, the sponsor company, the Koya Kirin. Without their support, we cannot have the, this webinar. So really, we'd like uh, to thank them. Uh, before we conclude, uh, uh, we'd like to announce our uh, uh, coming webinars after two weeks on 14 of July. We'll talk about the novel uh, potassium binders. Uh, so we'll send the announcement uh, in coming to this. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco Ima, no for uh, be being with us. Thanks, we am. Uh, see you in two weeks. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.